It's been over a week since I've beaten The Last of Us Part 2, and yet I can't really stop thinking about it. By the end, I felt depressed and empty inside, completely unsatisfied as to what happened, but honestly, I think about the game more and more, and my opinions start to change over time. I think The Last of Us Part 2, honestly, is the game where I appreciate it and it makes me do most of the work after I beat the game, both mentally and just pondering about what happened. It's a completely different game as to what I expected, what we all waited years for, and I like it in different ways and dislike it for other reasons. Today, let's talk about The Last of Us Part 2, full spoilers ahead. Originally, this video was going to be scripted and was probably going to come out next week or some sort, but just due to timing and honestly wanting to get my opinions out while everyone's still talking about the game, I decided just to make it a raw commentary style video. And honestly, for this kind of topic and the game overall, I think that's a better way to execute this, so... Let's just talk about the game and go through it all. Last of Us Part 2, as I said, a lot different of a game. The opening hours, especially. I think it's important to know what I knew going in. Obviously, the leaks happened, you know, about a month over. I made that video talking about how to avoid spoilers, and obviously, since I got a few thousand views, people targeted me with spoilers for... It was obviously going to happen. And, yeah, I knew going in that Joel died, and I knew about Abby. Those were the two big things I knew about. I kind of figured that Joel would die in the middle of the game, possibly, or towards the end. I still thought that this game would be about Dina dying originally, and that Joel would be still with Ellie and she, and he would die in the process or something like that, but that proved me wrong in the opening hours. Yeah, this whole entire game was focused on Joel dying. Literally. The Last of Us is about Joel and Ellie, and they killed off Joel in the opening hours, which is crazy. Um, originally, when I saw that happen, I thought it was quite of a shitty way for him to go out. And we only had a few scenes of them before he went out, and I was quite disappointed. But I think overall, as the game kind of progressed and we got context as to what happened in the years prior, and especially like the night before, the game kind of, I guess, the game did them a bit more justice than I was originally thinking they did. So I honestly really liked what they pulled off here. I would have liked Joel to get some more screen time. Um, especially in the opening hours to establish who he was today. Because a lot of the reasons and, I guess, criticisms I have with this game have to do with the executions to some of the plot points um, that just feel don't really feel believable at all. And also, some of the decisions in general were a little bit forced. And I feel like if they would have shown Joel off a bit more in the opening hours, because this game is so detailed and so much care has been into the whole entire game, but I feel like Joel was kind of just left aside for the very beginning of the game. Like, he didn't have much at all besides a few scenes. So yeah, I guess uh, this game's massive. It took me about 22 hours and a half to beat. Um, people were saying 25 to 30 hours, so I was fully expecting me to beat this, you know, within the first 20 to 25 hours. That's usually how it goes whenever press talk about how long it takes for them to beat the game. Um, yeah, easily Naughty Dog's biggest game. It felt like two or three games, arguably, if you include Santa Barbara's part at least. And yeah, I think it's like twice the length of Uncharted 4. So where do I start? Let's just start with the opening of the game with Joel dying. Yeah, man, a lot of my issues come with Joel dying the way he did. I don't have any, like, I don't have any reason or... I don't mind him getting his head, you know, caved in by a golf club. I mean, hell, a lot of people left The Walking Dead when Glenn got his head bashed in. And I was like, who gives a shit? Like, that's a brutal way to go out. Arguably, he's done worse things like burn corpses in The Last of Us 1 with the flamethrower. And yeah, obviously he just kills a bunch of people. Like, this man isn't some innocent guy. I mean, we already knew that going in. But just the way he went out felt really forced. The way that Abby was introduced as just this random character, you know, it just felt weird and forced that Abby would go out on her own and all of a sudden get saved by Joel and Tommy. Arguably the two people she was looking for in this community, Tommy, to get information on where Joel was. And then she happened to run into the man himself, Joel, by themselves. Obviously, they gave a little bit of context as Joel and Tommy go on these runs, you know, and these specific kind of pathways as, you know, Dina and Ellie were on the Crete one. Joel and Tommy are commonly a pair on the one they were going after. But just the way it all happened felt really weird. I just like so many of the game's themes, but whenever I think about Joel's death, I always get a little bit disheartened by the way he goes out. Like, the way he does, eventually does die, and he's talking shit in the last, you know, few lines before he does get hit in the head, is pretty much just like his character, which I really liked. But just the context and situations around them. A lot of people like to act that Joel and Tommy wouldn't act the way that they did, and... I believe Neil tried to describe it as this man's a father now. You know, it's four to five years past 
The Last was part one. Um, you know, obviously with part one, he was able to find a new daughter in Ellie, and now he's kind of just, you know, becoming a father again in Jackson and kind of starting a new life. You know, the first one was kind of about his redemption, about becoming a human being again. And yeah, I do believe that is a, you know, possible story to tell and what they tried to do with part one, part two, but I feel like they didn't execute that enough. Like we got the cut scene, um, which was practically the epilogue from um, the first game where he teaches her about future days, or at least performs it in front of her. Um, but besides that, we hardly get anything about Joel. Um, why wouldn't the players believe that he's still the man that he was in the first one when you don't give him any reason to believe otherwise? Yeah, just that's a bit of the issues going in. Anyway, I want to move past that. And that was probably one of the down notes of the game um, in terms of like, not down notes, because I really liked some aspects of that scene. I liked the way he went out, the brutality in the way that he does go out. But just the context around that, I still feel a little bit iffy on. Let's talk about Seattle, the new characters overall. Dina and Jesse are mainly the two companions that you're going to be playing with as Ellie um, in the first half of the game. I thought they were pretty good. Um, I originally thought they were all right. Um, on a second playthrough, it did make me like them a bit more. Jesse was one of my favorites, although he does have a short-lived run as he dies in the middle of the game quite suddenly, which I do want to talk about that later on. And Dina's pretty cool as well, although dramatically, <laughs> there's a lot of issues there with the fact that she does so much shit in this game, despite being pregnant, which actually, that's a common theme with Mel and Dina. Yeah, as a character, though, I really like Dina and, um, and Ellie's relationship. There was clear that they're, like, very best friends, and a lot of times that's where relationships kind of stem from. That was very believable. For talking about the open world aspect, I really like the secret scene with her playing the guitar take on me. It was really, really cool. The first half of the game did have a bit of pacing issues for me. They did the whole open world, you know, Seattle downtown kind of Western Gats again. And, yeah, I mean, I really like that aspect of the game because it did feel believable that's the thing a lot of these a lot of the environments in this game are still linear but they're very wide like i guess wide linear would be a good way to describe it and i do like that because it does make it a little bit more um believable as to these real world locations but still keeping it a little bit linear um but that being said in the second half of the game the levels do get a lot more linear and condensed than what they were in the first half and i'm not gonna lie i actually enjoyed the levels in the second half of the game better than the first so i guess you know, in terms of level design, the second half was a bit better in terms of that. Ellie and Dina are obviously entering Seattle trying to get revenge on pretty much all of the members that they saw that killed Joel. And they're going member by member trying to kill them off. Tommy was really good in this game. He's actually the one that goes to Seattle first and Ellie wishes. And Ellie goes after him. I mean, mainly she's going out for redemption, but she's there to join him and bring him back home alive. Tommy overall was a character that was kind of brushed aside in the first game because it wasn't really a vocal point for him. It was about Joel and Ellie, and he was just a supporting character on the side of that. In this game, obviously, since he lost his brother, he does a lot more in this game, which I wish they did a bit more with him, but what he does have in this game is pretty good, at least until, until the end, where his character kind of dramatically takes a turn that I don't really agree with. Yeah, a lot of these scenes are so good, like in particular how Dina finds out that Ellie is, in fact, immune is so good. Especially since you have that conversation in the prologue where she casually mentions it and then she brushes it off the side as she's just joking. Yeah, that was really cool. A lot of the environments in this game, Seattle looks so good gameplay wise. I guess I'll talk about that now. It's a step up from part one, obviously. Very satisfying and fun to play. Yeah, I guess a lot of the innovations or I guess focal points about this combat is in the realism of all the characters dying as I've already recovered, you know, going up into this game's launch. Characters screaming out each other's names, the brutality in terms of the animations as you shoot them with every bullet or arrow is really real. The face, the facial animations as you're killing them, it's pretty insane. Um, the two highlights for me have to be the dodge button and prone. Those two were just ultimately things that I feel like if I ever go back to the original Last of Us, it will feel very outdated because of that. Just because I can now fight infected one-on-one -on -one and not get hit in return just for some RNG sake. So that's really nice to see. A little bit more skill in terms of that, or at least more options in terms of the combat. Yeah, prone obviously is a great factor. You can be kind of pinned down behind cover, go prone in grass, and just completely go into a different room or a different house and get the enemy caught off. It's awesome. Yeah, I mean, there's more I could talk about in the first half, but I do want to talk about the second half since that's very controversial. You know, they have this whole scene at the theater where Tommy gets jumped, Jesse gets shot in the face, 
really um, kind of quite suddenly, which I do like how the deaths in this game are, in fact, very realistic. I immediately look back at the first one, and you see how Tess goes out. It's very dramatic. It's very heroic. You know, a lot of deaths in media these days are very heroic. You look at everything popular nowadays, a lot of them are just, you know, people being very heroic, and The Last of Us kind of goes every way against that, if that makes any sense. You're given characters that are completely flawed and making decisions you don't agree with, and the way they go out in this world as well is very anticlimactic. Jesse immediately is a character that you bond with over the first half of the game, or at least towards the end of the first half of the game, and then he just gets shot in the head just like that, and immediately he's gone just like that. I think the only character that was given somewhat of a dramatic death was Joel, but obviously that was for the sake of that being the full, you know, vocal point for why Ellie wants to go out and get revenge. But man, yeah, the deaths in this game are great because of that. I really like how they're not given heroic moments like that because that's what the game is trying to, you know, go against in every bit of its way that it can. But yeah, the second half, as I said, Abby. What do I think about Abby? That's probably what everyone wants to know. Do I like her? Do I agree with her? Do I like her more than Ellie? A bit of both, honestly. So, Abby is a character by the end of the game that I understood with, but ultimately didn't like. A lot of people like to pin it for different reasons. You can't kill off Joel and then make us care about a character that we're playing as for 10 hours afterwards, and I don't think that's true. I just think the execution in a lot of the Abby scenes and parts of the game weren't as good. They're trying to get us to care about a character more than a character we played a game and a half with. So you consider everything that she had against, you know, with her and her dad, we only get to play as that for a good 10 minutes to really understand that relationship and before it's dramatically just kind of taken away. Yeah, there wasn't really enough there for me to care about her more than, you know, I would any of the people on quote unquote our side in Jackson. I really liked her relationship with Lev. I think that was probably the best dynamic in this game. Lev is a really great character. He's part of the Seraphites, which were ultimately a group that was kind of casted aside. I think we don't really explore them as much as I wish they did. I mentioned earlier how I liked the second half of the game more than the first half in terms of the levels, and yeah, that is in part because of linearity, but also just because of creatively, it does get a little bit cooler in terms of going on tops of the bridges, which, you know, Lev calls the bridges, but turns out to be just broken cranes. They try to characterize and kind of flaw Abby as her fear of heights, which I'm guessing is just due in fact that a lot of people have a fear of heights, which was Naughty Dog's attempt to get us to kind of sympathize or empathize with her um, and care about her. Um, in that way, did I, I mean, yes and no, like, Abby in this game makes a lot more better decisions than Ellie does. A lot of them do feel a bit forced, but ultimately she's not a bad human being. She just came after Joel to get revenge for her dad that she lost, and ultimately the cause of her life. She was a firefly, you know, fighting to get the world back to the way it was. She lost all that because of Joel's actions at the end of the first game, and because of that is on this revenge path in the beginning of the game to kill off Joel Miller. Ellie in this game, as you can see, wants to kill every single one of them and gets revenge just like that. So, just based on the plot-wise alone, Ellie is the worst human being in this game. I still care about her more than I do about Abby, that's the thing, because of the execution for half of these scenes. We have the whole game of context behind Joel and Ellie's relationship in the first one, and you can't really cast that aside by giving us a few hours of Abby in the second half of the game to care about her more. Especially when the character dynamics between the two, as much as I like Lev and Abby, and, you know, the 10 minutes I guess we had with her father, it just doesn't come anywhere close as what we got in 2013 because of that. I honestly believe a lot of this game could have been better if the executions were a bit better. I like the themes overall, I like the reveal that Abby was in fact the daughter of the Doctor who, you know, some would argue feels a bit forced and doesn't need to be a, you know, a thing, but I actually do think that's a good idea. Just for the fact that, you know, anyone you kill in this world ultimately does have family members. Like, it's going to make sense that anyone you kill just... There's going to be consequences. There's going to be people's lives that you ruin because of those simple acts that you might just seem as one life, but ultimately has a chain of reactions at the end of the day. So in that aspect, I don't have any issues with that. I really like that. Marlene coming back was a cool moment. Just nostalgia there. Honestly, all the flashbacks were really cool um, in terms of everything that we gained. Although Abby's flashbacks, I cared more about Owen a bit. Owen's a character that I actually cared about quite a bit. He's kind of a bit of the hope in this game. At least he seems to be one of the more charismatic characters. Um, but yeah, as I said, the executions for a lot of this stuff. Like when Manny died in the second half, which, by the way, one of the best sequences in this game was the sniper. I immediately knew that was Tommy. 
Um, and that was such a cool way to go against, you know, such a pivotal character that we see as one of us, if that makes any sense. So that was pretty cool. But as I said, the execution, I cared. I was like literally cheering that man, he got shot in front of me as I'm playing as Abby because that was so badass. And ultimately, you see these characters, you see how much Ellie loses in the first half of the game and just how much she loses overall. And then you see Tommy finally get a victory in that sense. And yeah, I don't know. A lot of people like to say like, oh, if you don't care about Abby, you're just having a bias or like you're not getting the true understanding of the story. And I totally get what Naughty Dog's coming after, but... It's just the character that I understand, but I don't necessarily like, and that's just how it is. Like, I care about Ellie and Joel more because of the context with the first game that I played. And for many people, I feel like they know the same. Abby's not a bad character. I think Laura Bailey, honestly, was one of the better performances in this game, especially in the theater. It was really good. I liked Abby more than Nadine from Uncharted 4, which a lot of people like to hate on as well. Which, by the way, I wonder if half the hate on Abby is literally just because she's buff. Like, I don't understand that at all. Like, so what if she's buff? What does that do to you? <laughs> I don't know. It's stupid, man. There is literally a gym in the stadium that they stay at. So there's literally reasons for why she could be buff. And they're in the apocalypse. If there's no better time to be fit, it's then. It doesn't make any sense at all why people argue about that. So yeah, I do want to note some conversations that we got in the second half with Abby that a lot of people don't like to address, mainly because I feel like a lot of people hitting on this game didn't actually play the game, just because of half the stupid shit that they say doesn't make sense or didn't happen in the game. Um, Abby tries to take in Lev and help out Lev and Yara because she feels guilty for Joel. She clearly states that to Owen when he's asking why she's doing what she's doing. Pretty much all of Abby's plot in the second half has nothing to do with Ellie at all. She just kind of feels guilty for what she did back in Jackson. You can see how it affected all her relationships with her friends. People look at her differently now because of what she did, and she feels a bit guilty because she is a human being. She's not someone that was just going after her for the sake of, you know, ruining Ellie's life. She just wanted justice for what happened to her dad and felt like something would have happened if she did end up killing the person that was responsible. But ultimately her life is still the same, you know, the same as it was four years ago. And ultimately she wants to find a new meaning and she finds that with the two Seraphites that she gets hanged up with, Yara and Lev. And I really like that dynamic between the two. Yara and Lev were pretty great characters that sadly were introduced towards the very end of the game that we didn't get to explore too much time with but I really like that dynamic as well. It's just you talk about all these themes with the games in terms of religious and LGBT and I feel like a lot of people feel like they're forced in but you know Lev was such a good character that it felt so real you know like it didn't feel so forced that he was transgender and he was kicked out from this religious group that's something that commonly happens in the world today if you just look around, and yeah, that was a really cool way of kind of tying that in. As I said, I really like the relationship between Lev and Abby when they go across the bridge and ultimately try to get medicine um, and tools for fixing up Yara's arm. I will say the game did feel quite long. I said that there were some pacing issues in this game, and yeah, while there are some really cool sequences, I feel like a lot of the game is a bit too long. You think about the whole entire sequence between, you know, going on the crane and going all the way down the hotel, making your way to the hospital, and I swear that's like a few hours long. On one hand, I do like it because you literally see every step of the way on their journey towards the hospital and what Abby has to go through. But on the other hand, like so much of this game is very long that I feel like this game could have been a good, you know, 18 to 20 hours maybe instead of the 25 to 30 hours that it was. Maybe cut down a good five hours of that. Well, the first game had a lot of cool sequences where, like, I immediately think of Joel in the bus, you know, towards the very end of the game, you know, drowning underwater. A lot of this game is only fight to fight to fight, which I do like because I do like the Last of Us combat, but I did miss a little bit of that, you know, real world struggle of, you know, the apocalypse and these cool situations. We get a few here and there, and there's the caravan sequence that's towards the middle of the game, which you can clearly tell it's just Naughty Dog you know, DNA with Uncharted. We've always heard many times that Naughty Dog loves making Uncharted and just they had to do some kind of epic set piece there, which I found hilarious, even though it was in The Last of Us of all things. But yeah, the pacing of this game was a bit off. I did critique Uncharted 4 for having very bad pacing issues because of the game it was. Because it was a series about these big, you know, grand adventures. And yeah, I feel like I still have more issues with Uncharted 4's pacing more than I do with this game. Just because a lot of that pacing is very boring. A lot of the, you know, pacing in this game, it's a slow burn. 
but I also feel like it fits The Last of Us a bit more. So yeah, there is a bit more in terms of like the gameplay side of things that you can cut, but ultimately, yeah, the game is a bit too long at the end of the day. I feel like it could have been cut a bit more than it was. Games in general nowadays are kind of just very long just for the sake of value. You know, there's always those people online that compare their money and what they're spending on games to be dollar per hour, which makes no sense because the same people are going out to movies and spending $15 to see a two-hour movie. So I could go on and on about how stupid that argument is. But yeah, I, I do agree that the game is a bit too long. So as I'm editing this video, I realized I didn't touch on one important aspect of the game that I found pretty moving and one of the more influential parts of the game that I want to talk about here. I like on the first half of the game, you see Abby, or at least you hear about Abby, and you think that she's just kind of like a typical villain hiding away from Ellie or just moving on and kind of just doing her own thing or, you know, pretty much just being there and like you have this hatred towards her but as you play through the second half of the game you kind of realize that Abby's kind of just doing her own thing kind of living her life trying to make up for the things that she's doing and then you come back and realize that Ellie's just kind of fucked up your life there so it's kind of a cool way like of different perspectives that Abby isn't exactly just trying to hide living her life after killing Joel she's kind of doing her own thing and I thought that was pretty moving. It's a really cool use of perspective there that I felt was one of the better things that actually kind of executed really well in this game. So yeah, ultimately we do find ourselves going back to the theater, this time as Abby, and yeah, a lot of the game's pivotal plot points happen here, as I already mentioned. We see Jesse die in this sequence, and then Abby says to Ellie about how all her friends died because of Ellie, and that she gave her in a way out. She didn't kill Ellie, and then she wasted it. And I gotta say, this whole sequence was pretty cool, fighting Ellie. She was a bit better of an AI than, you know, most people. This kind of reminded me of, like, the David boss battle. And yeah, it did feel very uncomfortable to be fighting against Ellie, which is a character that's beloved to us. It did feel very uncomfortable, which I think was the point of that sequence. So I did like that, although I was very scared I was about to kill her, because the same spoiler that I read that Joel died, I read that, Joel, that Ellie does too. Like, it said Joel dies, Ellie too, and I was like, bro, Rhea Lily about to kill Ellie in a boss battle? That shit's whack. But luckily, she doesn't, and for a weird reason, to be honest, because moments before, she finds Owen dead and Mel dead, and literally, that's like the only few people in the world left that she cares about. Owen's her best friend. We get these flashbacks of how much Owen means to her and the relationship, almost as it is like the Joel and Ellie, you know, relationship. I know they tried to make that with her and her dad, but the flashbacks for Abby's side were with her and Owen. They built up this relationship just for him to die so casually, which I kind of liked, as I said before, more realistic. But then Abby kind of just goes after Ellie and then breaks her arm and forgives her. She smashes Dina's head in, almost kills her because she's pregnant, because Mel was pregnant, kind of like an eye for an eye. And yet, she doesn't because Lev says that she shouldn't. Which, by the way, for Lev's reasons, that's completely reasonable. There's dialogue talking about how he doesn't believe that the Seraphites are in the right because of their messiah. Pretty much saying that, you know, killing isn't the way. And that his people are losing their vision for what that messiah was saying. But for Abby, it makes no sense. Like, Owen Lily just died. And yet, that's someone that you cared about years and years for. Arguably your best friend and someone you loved. And obviously, there's the whole relationship aspect between them. And then she just forgives him. Like, it felt so forced. That was another thing that just didn't make sense for the character. Like, it almost like they wanted to make her feel peaceful just for the sake of making Ellie look bad. I mean, I guess you could say the argument is that Joel didn't really... Joel's death didn't, you know, satisfy her. So she didn't want to make the same mistake with Ellie. But if this person just came after you for what you did and, like, killed all your friends, like... I don't know, man. I feel like it would have made more sense for Abby to kill Ellie there. I mean, I'm glad it didn't happen, don't get me wrong, but it just felt a little forced just to make Abby seem like the yin <laughs> or something like that, you know? So yeah, then we cut to black and we are nine months later or thereabouts because of, you know, Dina's baby with Jesse. We see Ellie living the farm life, which by the way, it's so weird to think about Ellie being a mom now because you literally look at how fast these people growing up in this world. We see Ellie with Riley in Left Behind, and all of a sudden, in the second game, she's a mother. It's like crazy how much things can change like that. The farm sequence I really liked. I was kind of wondering where this was going. It felt very much like the Cassie sequence at the end of Uncharted 4, but given a lot more time and fleshed out. You see Ellie living, you know, on the farm that Dina mentioned earlier in Seattle, what she would do if she had a lot of money. She'd buy a farmhouse, and that's kind of like the payoff for that. She's living her life, but ultimately she can't shake the feeling of Joel. She still has PTSD from what happened to him, and she doesn't have any closure. She, she still feels empty inside, and we get some flashbacks of, you know, what happened the night before, which, by the way, man, those were 
So fucking good. Every single flashback in the game made me question where they ended off the relationship. Because you get these dialogue sequences before Joel dies about where Ellie is with Joel. She talks about seeing a movie with him. She also talks about um, to Maria about how Joel and her are fine. But we don't really see what happened there. And slowly and slowly we get bits and pieces about what happened between the relationships over the years. And how it wasn't so static. A lot of us thought that, you know... Her being immune and what Joel did with the fireflies at the very end and the decision he made for her um, that a lot of people did agree with and didn't agree with would be a major factor in the game. I always knew that was going to be brought up in part two, but the way it happened and the way it shook up the relationship in the years before his death, man, those flashbacks were so good. Every single time those flashbacks played, I was questioning where the relationship ended off every single time. And every part, it like proved me wrong until the final one, which is so good. So, yeah. We get a bit more flashbacks there in terms of like the night before the E3 2018 dance sequence. Tommy eventually does come around and it's revealed that he did survive the shot in the head that Abby did to him in the theater. So Abby and Lev literally took away everything that, you know, Tommy had. His brother, his sight, and his ability to walk and run, which is fucked up, man. <laughs> so yeah, Tommy can't do shit. He wants Ellie to go after her and kill Abby, finish the deed, and get vengeance for everything that Abby did to their lives. And... Ellie originally de declines. She doesn't want to risk everything. But later on that night, she does have a sequence where she remembers Joel um, in the night before at the dance and ends up realizing that she can't keep living the way she's living, just moving on with what happened to Joel. She wants some closure to what happened nine or eight months ago to get some closure on that whole part of her life and ultimately goes to Santa Barbara to look down and go after Abby. Abby and Lev by themselves, because Yara died, I guess I should mention that earlier on in the game, towards, you know, the very ending of Seattle, are looking for the Fireflies, because Owen mentioned many times that what he wanted to do was find the Fireflies again, because he heard rumblings that they were in Santa Barbara. Turns out the Fireflies are a thing, there's like a small group of them in, in the islands out near Santa Barbara, and yeah, they decide to go over towards them, but they literally don't even leave the house before they're jumped by this gang. So yeah, Ellie does end up tracking Abby down in Santa Barbara, which is really fucked up. This is honestly probably the fucked up group that we've seen in the world of The Last of Us, I'm not even going to lie. She's literally held up like on a pole near the beach, and Ellie ends up freeing her. It's like such a weird sequence where Ellie's tired and Abby's tired, and we're just kind of walking together towards the beach. Like, it felt so weird, but also just, I don't even know, man. And ultimately, like, Abby's getting ready to leave, but Ellie just remembers Joel dying, and she can't forgive Abby for what she did. So they end up just having a battle there on the beach, which happens to be the loading screen for The Last of Us Part Two. that whole boat sequence, so a little foreshadowing there. Abby ends up biting off Ellie's fingers, and Ellie eventually does get the hold of Abby and starts to drown her, but at the very end, she does get this kind of hint of Joel the night before playing his guitar, and a lot of people were kind of confused about that. I, for one, I really liked that, because how I perceived that was that she remembered Joel the night before he died, and that was the night that Ellie decided to start to forgive him, so she started to forgive Abby here. Again, it's a little weird though because Abby literally just bit off two of her fingers. So if you're really talking about realism in this game, like I would have fucking drowned the bitch, honestly. <laughs> but she does end up saving her and Abby lives and goes off to go find the fireflies with Lev. Ellie is left there not killing Abby. She's two fingerless, I guess you could say. She goes back to her home. Dina and the kid are gone. Tommy is undoubtedly pissed at her for not killing Abby. And all she's there left with is her guitar and her last memory of Joel the night before he died, where they agreed to start working on the relationship. And man, dude, the ending is probably what made this game so fucking good. Just everything about this game that I loved in terms of its execution, for the most part, was between Joel and Ellie's relationship, which is the part that irritates me so much about this game. Like, I loved everything about Joel and Ellie's relationship, between each other in the flashbacks and how real it was and how non-static it was. It kept moving throughout the game and we get context to why Ellie's really going out for revenge. This whole time, it wasn't really because that Joel died, if that makes any sense. It wasn't because he died that particular way and that she was just sad about his death. It was more about the fact that she wasn't given the opportunity to forgive him. She literally declared after those two years of not speaking to him that she would start to work on that relationship and then Abby takes that away from her the night, the next day which is so fucked up, man. So what do we leave with? We leave with Ellie pretty much dropping Joel's guitar, just leaving him behind, and going off into the woods on her own to figure her shit out, and that's when it cuts to black, man. And that's that's the last of us part two. It's so 
it's such a different game. Like, it's really hard to describe. Like, I feel to get a grasp on this game, you really need to play it. It's not a perfect game. As I said, I've listed so many issues that I have with this game in terms of its execution on so many levels that I don't agree with. I don't think it's a better game than the first because, quite frankly, the best parts about this game are built upon the first game. I think the first game, in a way, is a little bit more perfect. It's a little bit too perfect in terms of, like, its execution. This game is very messy. It's very real. And, yeah, Neil went on, I believe, the kind of funny spoiler cast to talk about how if the first game was about love and the good thing that come with it, and the second game is about love and the bad things that can come with it. I think it's pretty well spoken about what this game's theme is about. A lot of it's about the cycle of violence, about when it needs to stop. Again, just a lot of that doesn't make sense in terms of their actions, as I said before. Like, why would Abby not kill Ellie at the theater? Why would Ellie not kill Abby at the beach? Like, it doesn't make sense that these characters would just all of a sudden forgive them. You know, it is understandable, but the way it's executed isn't good enough, in my opinion, to showcase that. So, yeah, the last was part two. That was just me talking about that for a good 30 minutes or so. Very interesting. I do want to eventually get my opinions in some sort of scripted video like that. That will come in the future, I imagine. Um, but yeah, those are my thoughts on the game as a whole. Such a very different game. The first one was about Joel and Ellie. This whole trip across the United States. This is a very focused experience of character study between all these characters in Seattle in a focused place. And honestly, I believe part two did just as much for me emotionally than part one did for like the opposite reasons and I really want a part three I didn't want a part two I mean okay I'll rephrase that I didn't need a part two I thought that they could pull off a part two if they wanted to I didn't expect it to be like this obviously um but I really want a part three if the last was part one was about love and the last was part two was the downsides of love or I guess you could say hate if you want to summarize that I really hope part three is about hope. I mean, it might be hitting the nail on and it might be a little bit cliche, but I really hope that Ellie finds some sort of hope in this world in part three. There is a bit of a tease there at the end of the game that the Fireflies are still alive. Abby knows that Ellie is still alive. There's possibility that they still want to go after Akir. She might get involved in part three. Maybe it's eventually revealed that someone else is immune to the virus. I was talking to my friend about how maybe Ellie might find someone that's like a kid that's getting hunted down by the Fireflies for a cure, and maybe she looks after that kid and ends up bonding with them similar to the first game. That might be a little bit too cliche, but she might finally understand why Joel did what he did at the end of the first game, kind of come in full circle. Maybe that's how they include flashbacks. I honestly don't know how Joel would even fit in in terms of a part three. Like, it would have to feel... It would be very hard not to feel forced, if that makes any sense, so... Last was part two, everyone. A very different game than I expected going in. I liked it a lot. Again, this is more for a spoiler talk about the story beats in this game, more so than the gameplay. Um, but ultimately, I think those are the most important parts in terms of the conversation going on right now. And I guess the most passionate parts that I have to say. So, yeah, with that being said, I believe a lot of you guys have finished the game. So if you have, make sure to leave me your thoughts in the comments down below. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you're new here and this is the first video, which by the way, if this is the first video, that was a very interesting first video to watch of mine. Make sure to follow me on Twitter at OnlineZHD to keep updates on all my personal life and on the channel here. With that being said, I'll see you in the next video. Take care, everyone.